why aren't you eating? You know, why, why are you so sorrowful? Why are you grieving so much? Why are you in this state? Why are you crying? Am I not better than ten sons? Am I not better than all the sons in the world? Why? Because Elkanah couldn't quite understand the pain that Anna felt. He couldn't quite identify, because remember, he already had kids, he already had offspring. So he couldn't quite identify with the sorrow that he felt. Sometimes those closest to you can't even understand the pain that you're going through. Sometimes even, you know, your bosom buddy, your spouse, the one who's closest to you, who you share just about everything with, even they sometimes can't understand the sorrow that you feel. But one thing that we notice about Hannah is that she continued to find herself in the house of the Lord. She continued to find herself at the altar. So much so that in this particular occasion when they went up to feast, they went up to Shiloh to sacrifice. And she heard the, the cry and the laughter of the children and knew that they weren't hers. There was something that drove her into the temple that day. She was there sitting around with her rivals and all her kids and seeing how Penina would cut their food just so so they wouldn't show up and how Penina would scold her children. And something drove her into the temple. The Bible said that she arose and she went into the temple. And while she was there, the Bible says that she poured her soul out before the Lord. But Hannah wasn't alone in the temple that day, for old Eli was sitting in his seat by the temple. And he saw Hannah. He was there and he observed her. He observed her mannerisms, observed how she poured herself out before the Lord. But Eli didn't quite understand what was going on. You see, Eli assumed that she was drunk. Why? Because she was carrying on in a manner. She was speaking, but no sound was coming out. She was weeping and praying so bitterly that her mouth was moving, but there was no sound that was emanating out of her. And so Eli went to her and said, listen, wh why are you drunk in the, in, the, in the house of the Lord? Why, when will you put away your drinking and your, and, and your lavishness? But Hannah looked at her with that desperation and said, no, Eli, see, you've, you've got it all mixed up. Don't confuse me with those, with those women of Belial who come to sell their souls to their gods. But I'm a woman who's sorrowful of spirit. For there is something that I thirst after, something that I long for, something that I'm desperate. That the one that I love, even my husband can't give. But I'm here in the house of the Lord, for I know that only the Lord is able to satisfy this desire. Yes. Only the Lord is able to satisfy this need. Only the Lord is able to satisfy the longing and the thirst of my heart. Hannah poured herself out on the altar and emptied herself completely till there were no words left for her to speak. She poured out of herself. See, when you pour out of yourself, you pour until there's absolutely nothing left. You pour out until you're empty. Pour out until you've got not even a drop left in you. Hannah poured out herself in the midst of her grief, and in the midst of her sorrow, in the midst of her desire in this child. She poured herself out before the Lord and emptied herself completely. And Eli saw that desperation that was in her heart. Eli saw that desire that she had. And he said, don't cry anymore, my daughter. Don't worry yourself anymore. But may the Lord grant you the petition of your heart. But out of that desperation was what drove Hannah to the kingdom. It was that desperation that drove Hannah to the temple for her to pour out her soul, to pour out her everything before the Lord because she knew that it was only the Lord who could satisfy. That's right. Maybe we may have a difficult time identifying with Hannah's sorrow in her particular situation. But I'm sure all of us, as we think back over our own lives, we could all look at situations where we found ourselves at a point of desperation. Found ourselves at a point of where we were at our wit's end, where we didn't know what to do. Where everything we did came up short. Everything we tried led to a dead end. Everything we did came up for naught. I'm sure if we all look back, we can all think about 
about a situation in which we were so thirsty for something, but yet everything we did would come up short and no one else was able to provide that which we thirsted for. I remember back in 1999, it seems like so long ago and sometimes it seems like yesterday when we got the diagnosis that my dad was diagnosed with cancer. And I remember when he came home, I happened to be home from school that day, and he was talking to my mom, and I remember him saying that he couldn't even get the words out. He said, honey, it's, it's the big C. And I remember my mother's desperation, just first a shock of, a sense of shock. Be like, no, this, this can't be happening. See, this happens to other people. This doesn't happen to us. See, we're, we're good now. We just, you know, found ourselves in a place. My father had been studying for the ministry and was, you know, getting ready to, to graduate. He wanted to be a missionary. He wanted to go out and proclaim and, you know, go back to Jamaica and declare the word of the Lord. And so the, the shock and disbelief that came over her at first, like, no, no, this can't be happening. This, this, this is not happening. This, this, no, you know what? Go, we need a second opinion because this is not really what's happening. And then as a state of realization set in after going to doctor after doctor telling that he only had a few months to live, there was a sense of desperation that gripped her. A sense of a desperation, a thirst for something that no one else could give. And I remember this one time when my grandmother, who was living here at the time, and remember my grandmother came up to visit. And I happened to be home from school and I let her in and she asked me questions like, where's your mother? And so we searched and we called her and searched for her, couldn't find her anywhere. Couldn't find her anywhere. And finally it dawned on me, you know what, let's, let's go over to the church, maybe she's at the church. And I remember seeing my mother, live, I don't know how else to describe it, but holding on to the horns of the altar. There was a big, almost looked like a, a couch, and they had these beautiful antique legs, and she was holding on to the legs, and just pouring herself out before the Lord. To the point where, at some point, she had no words even left to say. She would just, just you know that groaning you get when you, just, you don't have the words to speak and your, your soul just groans inside of you? I can imagine that was very much what, what it must have been like for Hannah, where, you know, her mouth is moving and trying to make sounds, but it just, it, it's just not coming out. Why? Because there's a, that groaning that only the Lord can understand. My God. And I remember my mother just pouring herself out before the Lord in a way that only the Lord can understand. And I remember pleading with her mom, come home, it's late. For this time, it was, it was getting late in the evening. And she, no matter how much we pleaded and, and begged her to come, she just gripped the horns of that altar and hold, held on for, for dear life and continued to pour us us as if we weren't even in the room. So we left her. And I remember her coming home the next day. She didn't even come home that night. For she was so desperate for something, so longing for something. Because church, I, I don't know if you, you ever get so desperate for something. You, you know, you have your plans in front of you, you know, your plans for life. You know, you, my parents had planned to retire to Jamaica. And he, you know, my dad had built a plot of land and, and, and had started building. And so all the plans just start rushing in front of her face. And you start to think, Lord, how, is, how can this be? How can this be the situation that we find ourselves in? This seems so... Uh, contradictory to what we think should happen. But you see, sometimes we have our own plan. Sometimes we have our own way of doing things. But the Lord has a perfect plan. He has a perfect plan. And Romans 8.28 says that all things work together for good to them who are the called according to his purpose. See, what we fail to understand so many times is that the Lord has called us for his purpose. We're studying in New Converse class and we're reading about Joseph. And some of the things that Joseph endured, it seemed that there was a desperate situation. For first of all, Joseph was sold by his own brothers. You know, can you imagine being sold into slavery, sold into a land where you know nobody by your own flesh and blood? They sold him into slavery. They threw him in a pit and sold him into slavery. And then finally, Joseph gets to a point where he, he gets a little blessing. For the Bible tells us that he was blessed in Potiphar's house. And because he was in Potiphar's house, Potiphar's house was blessed. To the point where Potiphar said, you know what? I'm leaving everything in your control. Potiphar didn't even know what was in his own house. Except for what Joseph put before him. And see, here, from a natural perspective, not knowing the rest of the story, we would say, okay, you know, Joseph's being blessed. Yeah, he's still a servant, but he's got a blessing. And when we get a blessing sometimes, when we see something coming against that blessing, when we see something that we perceive as a threat to that blessing, we start to get defensive. We start to, to, to fight against what we think is a threat to our blessing. But oftentimes what we don't realize is that the Lord is working the situation for our good. 